Hi, I'm Andrew Dubber. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. Bengi Unsal is the senior contemporary music programmer at London's South Bank Centre, Britain's largest art centre and one of the UK's top five visitor attractions. Now, every year she's personally responsible for over 200 gigs and contemporary music performances at the Royal Festival Hall, the Queen Elizabeth Hall and the Purcell Room. She also manages the Meltdown Festival, which is the longest running artist curated festival in the world with names at the helm like MIA, David Bowie, Jarvis Cocker, David Byrne, Yoko Ono, Laurie Anderson, Robert Smith, Nile Rogers, and now Grace Jones as curators, which is all well and good in normal times, but times are not what you would call normal. Live music venues, concerts and festivals are of course among the most seriously challenged activities of the current crisis. And I found Bengi still working, but working from home. We spoke about technological solutions, the future of live music, Black Lives Matter, how to land a dream job like hers, the greatness of Kylie Minogue, and what the next big thing in pop might be. From Lax Lockdown London, this is Bengi Unsal. Enjoy. Bengi Unsal, thanks so much for joining us for the MTF podcast today. Thank you for having me, Andrew. So, okay, I guess the first question for you is, what was live music? What was live music? Yeah, we used to have this thing called live music. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what that was? <laughs> yeah, b- b- before COVID times, you mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel as we still have live music. But yeah, what was it? It was it was me going to South Park Center, going to Royal Festival Hall or Queen Elizabeth Hall or Purcell Room, and just like getting out of my usual life for um, an hour and a half, probably uh-huh. having extreme fun and being filled with joy, and just connecting with an artist eye to eye, and then feeling that I had some. Um, way in making that happen when I look at people's faces around me. Mm-hmm. That was live music for me. Right. So, I mean, you kind of got the dream job. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what that entails? <laughs> I mean, everybody says my job is a dream job. Yeah, I know. I, I kind of um, agree with that, but it has the, the end product is the dream. What gets you to that end, end product is actually like days and hours of normal work like everybody else does in front of a computer screen most of the time, um, listening to music maybe even less than some other music lovers do. And you're trying to put your taste in the equation, but not as much concentrating on the audiences who you're serving. It has different kinds of um, characters and uh, parts to it. Right. Tell, tell me what the job is. My job is I, I am head of contemporary music uh, at South Bank Centre. South Bank Centre is UK's and Europe's leading arts institution. It is uh, based by uh, the South Bank near the Thames in the centre of London. Um, We have Royal Festival Hall, which is 2,500 capacity, was built in 1951 after the Second World War, which I find quite poetic to bring joy to the nation after the war, because it was just like people's um, economic and emotional state were just like ruined by that time. And yeah, I find it quite poetic that they decided to do a festival of Britain and Royal Festival Hall was that building that they built to base it. It was also the place where they had the first concert of electronic music by British composers, wasn't it? I think I think that's Queen Elizabeth Hall, which was built in the 60s. And yeah, it was (laughs) it's a great building as well. So we have Queen Elizabeth Hall, we have Purcell Room, we have Hayward Gallery, which is like one of the leading arts galleries in London and the world, I would say. So uh, that's South Bank Centre and I do everything programming in terms of non-classical music. When we say contemporary in European countries, they might go like, oh, contemporary classical, especially, but it's not. It's like everything other than classical music I program and I'm um, responsible for, including the Meltdown Festival. Well, okay, Meltdown's a really fantastic example, but but give me some examples of some of the programming uh, choices that you might have made. 
I mean, it depends on the venue as well. Like Royal Festival Hall is 2,500 capacity. You can have a Paul Weller gig with an orchestra playing for the first time, which is recorded and then uh, press as an album uh, later on. Or you can have Meltdown Festival, The Cure playing a very special show or Peaches doing a, a like unbelievable, your eyes out of your butt, like kind of a, um, show as well. So it depends on the context a little bit, but it's rock, it's underworld doing an electronic music set, live set, although it's a seated venue, I, I feel it's the most comfortable standing venue in London because the seats go up. So you don't have to just like, you have your own space. You can go get your beer. It's just like very, <laughs> yeah, I like it a lot. Royal Festival. So it's, you can have Thundercat, you can have a jazz legend, it's just you can have a classical music concert. We have four resident orchestras as well, although I don't do programming for them. So we have literature events. We have dance and performance. I'm just responsible for that part of the program. Right. i got sort of two questions, and I think that they might be the same question. Uh, and that is, where does all your knowledge of music come from? And the other one is, where does your love of music come from? Is that the same question? Probably. I'm not sure. Maybe it's not. I think my love of music might be a bit before um, because my father, we had vinyls at, at home. We had a, a record player. Um, I was um, I was born in uh, Ankara, but I was brought up in Istanbul in Turkey. So I remember listening to his record collection from Pink Floyd to Cat Stevens to... Ruhi Su, it's like a huge folk artist in Turkey and just like jumping up and down over the seats, playing games with my sister. And that's probably where my love comes from. But then again, I can't say that I learned everything about music from my dad, not at all. But I, I don't know, I was just like so, I just loved listening to music or whenever I can, but I didn't have as much um, growing up. The first cassette I bought was probably when I was 13, 14 years old, because we didn't have that accessibility to, to that music. It wasn't easy. So I was just asking my father, could you please get me a cassette? And he would just go and get it. And it's Duran Duran Arena, for instance. But I didn't specifically ask for it. I remember asking for Rick Springfield, but... <laughs> The, yeah, I mean, it's it's a cousin, it's it's a, it's someone that you admire who is older than you, listening to a piece of music, and you go like, yeah, I want to be like them, and you start listening to music. I think that's how I started, and then my knowledge probably came through. We had satellite TV, and we had Sky. Ah, oh, there was this guy. His name escapes me now. He had this two-hour radio show like. TV program mm -hmm. with a background and like a very static background. And you used to listen to his, we used to listen to his voice and he would just like put on videos as well. And then, and then MTV we had through the satellite. So I listened to a lot of mainstream pop music mm -hmm. growing up, but my mom was also a piano player and we had a piano at home. So which I didn't get to learn, unfortunately. It's a, it's the, it's a big regret. But. but starting with Rick Springfield, <laughs> you went <laughs> really deep into some really kind of esoteric music, some really, I guess, intellectual music. Your, your uh, approach to contemporary music seems to be very quality driven. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I can say that. Like, I was really into pop music at first. Like, I know the whole catalogue of Kylie Minogue. Uh -huh. I, I have been a huge fan all my life. Kylie's quality. Yeah, Kylie is super quality. And then um, I listened to Madonna. I listened to In Excess. Like, I listened to a lot of mainstream, not, not pop always, but I, I'm not sure if it was esoteric. At, <laughs> but it has definitely became eclectic as I grow up. Like, definitely became quite eclectic. And I started working at music in 1995 mm -hmm. in a um, TV station, music TV station as well, which meant that I had to listen to different kinds of music as well. So I think that kind of fed into it. Right. If that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Because I, I think to go from music fan 
to head of contemporary music at uh, <laughs> South Bank Centre. There's stuff in between that. And so, like, working in music television, I guess, but you've been a DJ, you've run a festival. Yeah. What was kind of the path? What was the sort of, I guess, the chronology of that? It's 24 years in the making. <laughs> So basically, when I first started, I remember just like being at home watching MTV all the time, where I, whereas I should have been at university studying business administration and management. Mm -hmm. um, I was basically really just spending the whole day watching TV. And then a friend of mine um, who was working in a music, music TV station, they, they had an agreement with MTV in Turkey. So they were, I, I just, just pulled all my courage and said, Özgür, do you have a job at the radio and the TV station? Because like I would be cleaning the floors if I can just like get into that building mm -hmm. because that's how I, that's where I feel I belong. And, and they, they were like, oh, we're looking for someone at the MTV side of things. So uh, the TV, music TV side of things. So why don't you just come and just interview for it? That's how I started in 1996, I think. All right. And then, you know, you were talking to, uh, we were talking to record labels, getting videos on Betamax, like big, big cassettes and stuff. Yep. And um, I, that made me start a relationship with the uh, universal then Polygram, Polygram music. And then I started working there. I was thinking of going and having a master's degree in New York uh, about music business. And then the person who was head of international at uh, Polygram said, why do you go and just spend a lot of money? You can start working here and you will, <laughs> you will learn it from the bottom up. And then I started as a junior product manager there. And I basically, when I quit, I was head of international. And then I went to BMG, um, worked there for a year. And then I said, yeah, I'm going to do my own festival. Um, and did the, did the third edition of the first open air festival in Turkey uh, called H2000, went completely bankrupt. Um, <laughs> Welcome to the world of running festivals. Yeah, well, it, it was actually good. It was just like this other, other stuff that, you know, when you are, when you want something to happen, sometimes that love makes you blind. So I didn't see the problems arising. Um, we had sponsors, we had really good acts, we, our ticket sales were good, but like the uh, bureaucracy of things with the municipality, with the landowners, like we had problems there and it just became a disaster for me. So I went bankrupt before I was 30 <laughs> and I spent probably quite a lot of like nearly a year in depression. Uh, <laughs> thank God my parents helped me through that. Um, and I think it was a blessing in a way, uh, in hindsight, in hindsight, as they say, hindsight is 2020. <laughs> yeah, and, and in what way was that a blessing? You know, because if I succeed then and made money, I would, I think the way I see it, I wouldn't be concentrating on what was important for me, why I went, went into that business. I would be, I, I feel that I could have been infatuated with success and money and I could have, whatever I did wrong in the first one, if it slipped and if I became successful, I think it would come harder in the second one. Right. Because still there's not a lesson learned there. That's the way I chose to take it. Mm -hmm. And I, it, I'm not regretting it. It was horrible, but I'm not regretting it. And then I started working for um, Charmenko. is like a European um, booking agency. They book uh, artists to... Eastern European festivals and events with Nick Hobbs. I worked with him for a year. And then um, I went to Istanbul Jazz Festival as the assistant director, worked with Pelin Opcin, who, is La, who used to be Istanbul Jazz Festival director. Now she's London Jazz Festival director. So it's nice that we're in the same city again. Lovely. Yeah. And then I ran a record label for two years again, this time a local rec record label called Double Moon which was um, quite the coming up with, I think, really amazing music, which was a fusion of East meets West, but not mm -hmm. in a cheesy way, really top quality, top notch way. Um, and I really loved that experience and I did it for two years. And then Istanbul Foundation for Culture and Arts, 
who does the Istanbul Jazz Festival, who I used to work with, uh, they basically said, we're opening up this venue. Would, would you like to come and run it? So I went and I basically, it was just like four walls. Um, and I was the artistic and the managing director of that menu for six years, mm -hmm. which became really, really successful. Um, yeah, and then I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted another challenge basically. And I wanted, I started looking around. I knew that I wanted London to be my next space. And I worked, looked for the right job for a year and a half. Wow. Because I wasn't, I wasn't in a hurry, you know. I was, my life was very comfortable. Istanbul is a beautiful city uh, with an amazing nightlife. Um, I knew everyone. Everyone knew me. It was my comfort zone. Right. So I was happy to just be there as long as it was, like, until I, I found the right challenge. And then South Bank, I applied online. And miraculously, they got me. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing there were probably a few people in line for that gig. So uh, you must have uh, interviewed well. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, maybe being in Istanbul and working for Istanbul uh, Foundation for Culture and Arts gave me that multi-art discipline that South Bank Centre has as well. And also... Mm -hmm. Being a venue in Istanbul, I booked a lot of artists. I took the chance on like Nils Fram. I booked Nils Fram, Olafur Arnold, Sam Vincent, John Grant. Like those, those artists were not big then when I booked them for our 600 capacity venue. Wow. But when you look at them on a CV, you go like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> because they're like, they're headliners, right? In, in a way. Yeah. So, um, Maybe they might have. And I all, during my Istanbul Jazz Festival times, I, I was involved in like Nora Jones, Rob, Robert Plant, Roger Waters, Shakira, big, big, big gigs. Yeah. So it looks good on a CV. Sure. Maybe that's why. What's the main difference for you working in say, Istanbul and working in London? Um, first of all, the structure of the business industry here is different. Um, in Turkey, venues are the promoters in mostly and in uh, London venues are mostly rental spaces they do their own promotions as well like we do at South Bank Center and some other venues do I'm sure but it's mostly the promoters go and hire out the spaces and they do their own shows um, so that was the first thing that just struck me as as different and then the the working culture is completely different um, London, London people, just like from nine to five or six, whatever, they come at their desk, they work. They rarely have communal lunches. Whereas in Istanbul, you come to work, you take your coffee, <laughs> you go back, uh, you just have a chat with your uh, friends, colleagues. It's more of a, and then you go out for lunch, you spend, you, you become friends. I'm not saying I'm not friends with my colleagues. I love them and I am friends with them. But I think... The Mediterranean warmth and the way of living life is different than what you have in London. Yeah, um, I would say that's the that it, those were the main two differences for me. And also, I, although I knew all of the agents, um, I didn't know most of the promoters, so I had to get used to that kind of working. And the the fee structures are different um, when you're in Istanbul. The costs are different. Um, the competition is different here. So yeah, I had to. It took me probably two years to get used to it. Is access to artists any easier uh, when you're in London? Mm, depends, as I said, because it goes through the promoters, and promoters sometimes you have to have good relationships with the promoters and the management. I think and agents, like all three of them, not just with the agent, is not enough um, this time. Uh, around so maybe it's easier if you're going through the um from the emerging level up because then they want to be supported by an ins institution like south bank center or an inst or a promoter they want to be supported they need that but on the top level it's probably more it's a business right we we have 2500 capacity we can't actually pay as much as what 
the big festivals or the promoters can pay. And that is very um, frustrating at times. Right. So all of these is in the context of ordinary times. And I guess a, a large part of what you do is sitting at a laptop and sending emails and talking on the phone. But And you can do that at home, I guess. Uh, yeah. But there's a large part of your job that you probably can't do at home. Do you want to talk about how the sort of the lockdown thing has affected what you do? At this specific time, it was really great in terms of I really think I can personally work better at home. I'm more efficient. I don't like commuting. We have an open um, open office, which I can't concentrate that that well. I really am more comfortable and more efficient working from home. So I did get a lot of work done, especially when we had to postpone or cancel gigs and it needed my undivided attention. So uh, the first months uh, were that the, the, the problem of this, what I can't do, I can't do Meltdown Festival. It was supposed to happen last week and we couldn't do it. It's going to happen next year. If I, I can't go and just like, even if you do a digital concert or you can't talk to the artist face to face, you can't just like touch them on their arm. You can't give them a hug. And that's like, you know, that's me. That's kind of how I operate yeah. on a personal level. That not having that is a is a difficulty. Um, I think there's a fatigue of having um, Zoom and video calls for sure. Like at first it was interesting and it was um, exciting. I think and I was like, yeah, we're talking only half an hour, an hour. Everything is focused. We get the work done. Amazing. No more um, useless meetings, etc. But um, after a while, I think after four months, it's it just, it's not too good just <laughs> having to look at one computer screen. It's quite tiring doing the, the Zoom video calls. It is yeah. tiring. But yeah, yeah I, can't, I can't complain. I really love working from home. I mean, I would love to, I was thinking of that. If I don't know if we're going to ever go back to the office in the sense that, because the times are changing, right? This, this effect, we cannot say, oh, okay. It's back. Let's go to the way our life was before this. I think it's, it's going to change. So I was just thinking, what kind of an office, what kind of a workplace would I want to have? Um, um, so I, th- I think in my ideal world, I would still be working from home, mm. but like maybe once every week, I would like to go to a place which I don't maybe call an office where they were like, couches and then like a coffee machine good quality where I could have quality time with my colleagues where they tell me what they read what they saw it's not just like sitting in front of a computer but having that real kind of interaction that would be my dream scenario going forward and I hope that it happens and how's the output of that work going to be affected. I mean, you talk about something like Meltdown Festival. Mm -hmm. That's about bringing a large group of people all together uh, in a way that probably isn't sort of encouraged anymore. How's that going to change? Yeah, I I think if you look at where I live in East London, if you go to a park, you can see people are gathering up. (laughs) They're just like so looking forward to going out right now. I think maybe um, the way we do programming for which audiences might have to shift a bit. Um, At the beginning, I'm not sure if the older ones, the vulnerable, the people who feel that that they are vulnerable might not be willing to go out as quickly as the younger generation. So that might affect how we program uh, our venues. Um, But let's wait and see. I think Meltdown always, because there's the artist involved, it's the perfect, set up for a festival. Everybody mm. wants to be associated with Robert Smith, uh, Nile Rogers, Grace Jones. They want to see for them sure. walking down the, um, on Riverside Terrace. So yeah, I think, I think, I hope, I'm hoping it won't be affected. Uh, and I'm hoping maybe it will be um, affected in a positive way where people want to come together and enjoy that unity together but you're right we can't be just naive and think that it's going to be the same it's not going to be the same have you had to give any thought to the idea of like uh, online performances or anything like that or have you just sort of said no no we're not doing that that's not what we do um 
I think that's what, what we should be doing. Um, I, I have been a big advocate of um, tech and online live streaming, etc. cetera. Um, when you have a big company that is, it's not just SoftBank Center, by the way, I think it's many other com companies right now, probably including even Live Nation. When they have a certain way of doing things and when it's successful, they don't want to look at other opportunities that much. And that emergent opportunity come and just like bite you in your, in your face. And they go like, oh, what happened? Oh, it has been coming. You just didn't realize. <laughs> so I think live streaming in terms of concerts, maybe it was coming. The VR technology was coming. There are companies who are doing it. Uh, but this coronavirus situation is just forced it so much on us. Then there's suddenly it's so accelerated that maybe most of the companies are left behind already, including us. So, yeah, we definitely want to do it. I think, let me talk from a contemporary music point of view, I don't think it's going to go away. I am sure it's here to stay. Maybe it's going to take um, five years, three years, I don't know when, when coronavirus goes, if it goes. And if everything goes back to the new normal, uh, people might start going to live concerts again. Of course, it's a completely different experience. But I think there is definitely a market for this experience as well. And it, we have to do it. We have to, we're late in uh, getting ready for it, but we're going to have to accelerate our systems and, and, and get there. I definitely am a big believer <laughs> in it. Or at least on the possibilities. I'm guessing you are as well. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little. Yeah, I mean, I the experience of a uh, such a mediated event is uh, is kind of a weird one for me. But then I've never been a big one for crowds, so I guess. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm a fan of records, so the, my my experience of music hasn't changed quite so much. I I have records as well. You know, when first MP3 started, I was completely against them, like really completely, because I was like probably working at the record label back then, and I didn't like the fact that it, that it was piracy involved. But then now I use streaming services all the time. I do have a record player. Yeah. And I play records and I keep on buying records as well. But to me, that's a different experience than scanning and maybe just like background music. So I, I feel still um, there will be, and also geographically, you know, we don't know if we're going to be able to travel as much. You know, there was the climate change uh, pressure coming in any ways. Like we were thinking, do we really need to go to Berlin by flying or France? With, with a plane. So now I think people will be more, yeah, I bought three, four digital concert tickets uh -huh. um, over the past month. I just bought one today, this morning, actually, to a Leanne Le Havas gig at Roundhouse. All right. Yeah, it's, I paid £12 for it and I'm happy about it. Fantastic. So do you think, I mean, obviously there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, COVID-19 being disastrous for the creative sector. Do you think anyone's seeing any upside? Is there anybody kind of benefiting uh, from this kind of new situation? Probably Spotify and Apple. Is. I, I mean, in the past three months, their market value just doubled, I think. Spotify's. Wow. I was really hoping you were going to say small independent artists, but you know, uh, no, <laughs> it's not how the world works. It's, it's not good for the small independent, independent artists, unfortunately, and it's not good for grassroots venues. It's not also good for uh, big companies like us because we are, because of our costs and the way that we are structured. Like, um, what was the number? I can't remember the exact number right now, but yeah, 46 million pounds is required to save grassroots venues in the UK alone. It's just like, it, they're in so much hardship. And I'm, I'm, I'm part of Music Venue Trust, I'm in the board. So they've just raised over two million pounds to help those venues and they're saving venues. They're doing a great job and the government is helping, trying to help with the furlough scheme, but it's not, it's not enough. It's just like, we are, I don't know, I know, but we are going to lose at least five million pounds. And that's if we open in April. If we open it before that, we're going to lose even more. Right. 
because of our costs and because of the decreased capacity that we can get back onto. With small, smaller artists, independent artists, maybe they might be uh, to their record sales, to their funding options, they might be getting stuff, but they don't have any live income coming and they are going through so much hardship. Mm. And we should do our best to support those artists because the big ones, they are postponing their um, tours. Maybe they can more than the others afford writing a year off, but certainly not the um, emerging artists, the smaller artists, and actually the whole industry supporting those artists, mm. the hosts, the like production crew, the, the it's, it's, it's a huge industry that is servicing us and they are going through a huge hardship as well. Yeah. I, I spoke to Beverly Wittrick from the Music Venue Trust uh, yeah. early March, just before this kind of kicked in. And music venues were already not having a very good time. Is, is the government yeah. sort of stepping up and, and uh, making any kind of concessions to the fact that, A, it was already hard, and, and B, now it's impossible? Mm, they're trying their best, I think. But it's just like, I mean, Music Venue tr- Trust is trying their best. They're, they're doing everything they can. They're writing open letters to the government. Mm. They're just like, they're amazing. And all, some artists are uh, supporting them as well. So the, these funds are being raised. Mm. But the government, if you, if you look at, I'm not saying they're not, they are doing enough or they're not doing enough, but I think they're doing, trying to do something. That's my opinion. Of course, they need to be doing more. They need to be giving more to South Bank Center as well because like not just us, like every other institution, but that, that's the thing. How are you going to prioritize? Mm. How are you going to, the hospitals? It's hard, but as I said, Beverly and Mark are doing their best to attract their attention to, and they've done, they've come a long, long way in the past, past five years. They've actually put the grassroots venues as a, as a word, like as a term into the, into the sector. So, yeah, they're amazing. Fantastic. Well, it's not just uh, COVID-19 that's kind of uh, in the news now. Obviously, the Black Lives Matter thing is uh, a really yeah. important issue. Well, on that, how does that impact upon what you do? For instance, what's your approach to, say, inclusion and programming? I mean, it has always been on our agenda. We, it's not a tick boxing exercise, but we look at our numbers. And Arts Council also wants us to just give those answers. Um, I was just looking at it. Like we look at how we um, program BAME artists. We look at the audiences. Like I was actually looking just yesterday on meltdown, last year's meltdown numbers, and it was 49% BAME Mm -hmm. on Nile Rogers year. Um, This year it was going to be, I don't know, 80% BAME with Grace Jones's uh, meltdown, but it's, going to happen next year now so it it is very important to us but in terms of improving um, we have actually made a commitment Uh, our CEO and the exec board made a commitment saying we have been working on it but we um, also accept that we're not good enough yet and we have to improve ourselves that's why we need to be accountable so we're just going to publish our numbers we're going to um, publish what we're going to do in the next years. But it's, it's also very, yeah, that's, that's what we do. In terms of our staff, in terms of our senior management, we have to be more diverse. In terms of our artists and our audiences, I think we're doing great, but we need to do even better and yeah, do, our, do our share, basically. Yeah, because it seems that like one of the big conversations over the last, I guess, five years – uh, that I've noticed has been about uh, inclusion of women in uh, in music programming, and now the kind of the emphasis is kind of I don't know if it's less on that. Would you say or or um, there's, I, th- I would say maybe it's not on top of the agenda right now. But again, like Robert Smith's year, forty six percent female. Is that sorry? Is that is that at the front of the stage, or is that including the the band, or is it including the technicians? Or? No, no, not technicians. It's it's the band. Aha. Uh-huh. It's the band. If it, 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 the artist has 
female member or members or front members. It's just like not the technicians. The technicians are like South Bank is, is a very female institution, I should say. Sure. The our chairwoman and then CEO, director of music, me, director of production. It's just like quite a lot of female leadership um, in our company, director of administration, arts administration is also female, like quite a lot. But uh, yeah, you're right. I think now it's taken a back seat maybe, but it's now is the time for Black Lives Matter to take the front seat. So it's gonna take the front seat and we, we shouldn't be, that doesn't mean that we should be forgetting about that. Not just the women also, but it's not just male, female, right? Non-binary. Sure. <clears throat> so we should not forget about those things and going to the same direction, whether Black Lives Matter is on the front seat or not. Yeah. But in the same wagon, I think. It does, yeah, it does occur to me because there are other things we should be thinking about, like the, uh, the eco uh, uh, considerations, the accessibility of venues and, and those sorts of things. And, and I guess this is, it kind of feels like an opportunity to sort of redraft the rules of how we think about live events. Exactly, exactly. Actually, just before COVID-19, there were talks about this. Like I remember reading, for instance, Emma Banks, who is like one of the biggest agents in the music industry, saying our bands should start thinking about uh, their stage setups. Do they really need this much of um, equipment? Do they really need that kind of show? Do we really need to fly tons of stuff to somewhere? They should be thinking about the green eco, um, ecological impacts of what they do. We should be looking at our footprint, basically. So it was just happening there and then this happened. I hope that all these together, like what the, the technology, like with the technology, that acceleration, I hope it accelerates where we're going to go and how we look at things. I really do hope that this is the positive output of the times that we've been going through in 2020. I really do hope. You mentioned when you were back in Turkey and you were putting on acts like Oliver Arnolds and uh, Niels Fram and, and people like that before they were Oliver Arnolds and Niels Fram. Who are the people that you're looking at now thinking we need to get on these people now? <laughs> who should we be looking out for? Oh, that's a very hard question. And I don't know if I can answer that. Um, one, one example would be really, really good. Um, so we have the slot at South Bank Center every Friday between six and seven. We pick artists that we think are going to be the next big thing. Uh -huh. It's called Future Tense. Cool. Uh, so we just give them a slot to have this concert every week. And it's just like 400 people come to watch all those bands. Mm -hmm. And then we hope, and some of them already did, they go from Future Tense to Persa Room, which is our smallest capacity, and then hopefully to Queen Elizabeth Hall and then to Royal Festival Hall. So we try to nurture them through that system. So if you check the Future Tense <laughs> tab on our uh, South Bank Centre website, those are the people who we think are the future. Brilliant. I'll put a link to it on the, uh, on the show notes as well. <laughs> Thank you. Given that you have what a lot of people would call the dream job, <laughs> is there a kind of a next step that's an obvious thing for you to go to? Or is there, a, is there a, like a progression beyond this? Um, I don't know. It's a very hard question because I'm still very much, I feel there's so much more I can do at South Bank and I'm very much committed to my job there. Um, and I really, really want to make more of it. And what I have been always interested about I'm more interested now is the digital side of things and the tech. Like I, I would be interested to challenge myself, develop myself in that area more. I think it, to me, it's, it's more like, how can I learn more? How can I use what I've learned over the years to do something else that is a different version, a better version of, of what I've done until now. So, yeah, I think that's, that would be a good progression in a way. Because I really do believe that's what the future is going to hold. Um, I don't know. I'm constantly thinking that, that I can tell you. But more in the what can I do for South Bank um, as a member of the staff to make it even better. What's your favorite example uh, that you can think of of music tech in performance? People using 
new types of musical instruments or or technology in a new way on stage? On stage. Yeah. I mean, I've not seen anything other than the gloves after, and it has been years, but we did like VR. So you put the VR on and you're in the orchestra and everybody is, we did it with uh, Philharmonia Orchestra. We do th- that kind of things. And yeah, I need to get a list of things from you to pass on to my participation colleagues, it seems. But I'm more, in- I think personally, I'm more interested in the, tech of the distribution and the participation in the digital sphere and the analog of making music. Yeah. But that's a personal. Absolutely. So what's your kind of hope? What does next year look like? What do you, what do you think um, would be a good outcome of all this? Um, I mean, the, the good outcome would be that we would be looking at what's really important and uh, try to get lessons from it in terms of our management and the way we put acts on from Black Lives Matter to diversity, to inclusion, to climate change. Uh, but then again, like on a very practical note, my I would hope that we start in January, the latest, and not April, and start doing things uninterruptedly. If it's not going to go away, um, I think we just need to get used to living with it. And we have to find ways to keep that interaction going in the physical space as well. Whether it's with masks, I know it sounds and looks weird and it's very uncomfortable, but really I think we need to get the life going. So that's that's what I ask for 2021. Hopefully we can get some kind of clarity and sanity back. Um, Yeah. And what would you say to somebody who is looking at you and thinking, that's what I want to be when I grow up? (laughs) Um, I would say thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much. Any tips there? My, My tip would be just like working hard and trying, I think, not assuming that you can't get that job. You can't do that thing. Just like go and talk to people and just show that you're interested Try to get it done and work. It's not just like getting the job. It's just getting the job is just all the ideas that you have because the young people have a lot of ideas, but it's, it's just not those ideas. You have to make them happen. And in order to ha- make them happen, you have to work and be determined. I think that's my only, yeah, that, that, yeah. that's my advice to anyone for anything actually. Bendy, thanks so much for your time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Andrew. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. That's Bengi Unsal, and that's the MTF Podcast. You can follow the Southbank Centre on Twitter. That's at Southbank Centre. And Meltdown Festival is at Meltdown Fest. I'm Andrew Dubber. You can find me at Dubber on Twitter. And Music Tech Fest is at Music Tech Fest. Not just on Twitter, but absolutely everywhere. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure you're subscribed and you can share, like, rate and review, which is going to help other people to find it. Of course, if you didn't like it, but you're still listening, there are lots of other episodes to check out that might be even more your sort of thing. So go have a look through. In the meantime, have a great week and we'll talk soon. Cheers. 